isn't he good? I'm so thankful to be in the house of God. How about you? Let's lift our hands in this place if you can. Father, we just worship you. You are faithful.
know this song, right? Saturday was silent, surely it was through. Since when has the possible ever stopped you? A Friday's disappointment, a Sunday's empty tomb. Since when has the possible ever stopped you? This is the sound of dry bones rattling. This is a praise make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm calling out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. Oh, 
Let's give God a shout of praise in this place. thing we need is in the south to have a southern rock song played in church because we will start acting southern in a second all right all right all right okay all right put it together pull it together all right fix your get yourself get your get your tie tighten back up and Pour your shorts up a little bit and pour yourself together. Are you glad you're in God's house today? Come on, third, third service, one more time. Put your hands together and bless the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> wow. If this is what 300 people in a room sounds like, imagine when we get to fill this place up again devil's in trouble all this chaos he's been creating over the past few months he's gonna pay for this and uh, I, I feel like we're we're here on Pentecost Sunday I feel like the book of Acts when the church was birthed and 3,000 people got saved I feel like we are in a rebirthing move of God I think the church is being born again and I hear the sound man I hear the sound. I know our TVs and our news media are telling us something different, but I hear the sound. I hear the sound. I, I don't condone it at all. The, lie, the, the looting and the, and the rioting. But what I do hear is a sound. What they're, what they're taking and what they're doing is not, is not going to satisfy them. What I hear and what I see when people run into stores and they take te televisions, I, I don't see that. Like, like Jesus said, he said, I see sheep without a shepherd. And when I look at America, I hear the cry of a nation saying, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. And we are on the verge. We are we are about to fall into a revival and an awakening like we have never seen before 
whatever you experienced in the past isn't going to compare to the glory of God that's about to be revealed in the earth come on if you believe that God is up to something good in spite of all of the chaos and the craziness that you see around you come on give God some praise right now because we believe that he is up to something I'm suspicious that God is on the move Hallelujah. I've never been more convinced that God is at work than I am right now. <laughs> Come on. I'm, this is what I need you to do. I got a message. So I need you to take a seat for a second. Maybe give somebody an air high five. Or if you feel a little radical today, maybe a fist bump. You could even ask, hey, I'm a hugger. Can I give you a hug? And uh, if they say, yeah, go ahead. If they give you the big, <laughs> don't force them. Don't force them. Uh, we're trying to, trying to be understanding during this time. It requires a lot of patience and understanding. So I do want to say thank you to you all for uh, taking the time to register for be it, for, to be at this service today. I never thought in my lifetime I would ever see a time where we would have to register to go to church. Um, but here we are. And uh, we're trying our best to gather as the Bible tells us, hey, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as some do. Um, and so we recognize that in the New Testament, the believers gathered under great threat of persecution in their own lives. And so I told somebody, I said, as soon as they'll, they'll release us to, we're going to gather again, even though there are risks involved. But they're asking us to abide by the social distancing guidelines. So we're trying to do that and respect that as well so thank you so much for your understanding and your patience through this time and uh, I'm really grateful for you church are you thankful for this church are you thankful for this body of believers and the people you're sitting next to and sitting uh skipped row behind how you like that um really creative with our tape we just but I, you know, in church, you just never know. I'm surprised no one has just been like, nobody gonna tell me where to sit. I'm a child of God and just rip that tape off today. Y'all have been incredible. And so thank you so, so much. Uh, today, if you, if you haven't noticed yet, we do not have childcare at this point. And uh, so for all of the parents who have brought your kids to church today, you guys are heroes and your kids are incredible for uh, being here and being a part of this moment. And it's exciting to see little kids worship the Lord their dance moves are so inappropriate but they are so perfect for this moment and I love every minute of it and so to all the parents who brought your kids out thank you so much for being here they're incredible hey I'm gonna I'm gonna jump into this message and so I'm gonna go ahead and pray and I believe that God is gonna speak something really encouraging and hopeful into our lives today so, Father, in Jesus' name, we ask over these next few moments that you would speak clearly to us. We need your word. We need you now more than ever. And uh, in my lifetime, I've never, uh, I've never as intensely studied your word as I am right now. I've grown up in church. I've read this Bible through multiple times. I've, I went to college. I've I got a master's degree in this thing and I have never in my life felt an urgency for your word like I feel right now. I've been preaching for 20 plus years and I've never felt like I do in this moment. So God, you must be trying to draw something out of us that we've never seen or experienced before. And we thank you for it. In Jesus name we pray and everybody said amen. Amen. Hey, can we say thank you to a few people today? I want to say thank you to all of the volunteers who have made today possible by setting up and cleaning and in between each service have, have just gone through and made sure that this place was safe for you and your family. Can we thank those volunteers who have been doing that today and prepping and making this possible? You guys are amazing. And I want to thank uh, through all of this, our media team has been so awesome and uh, making sure that we got the stream every week. Uh, thank you guys so much. Can we thank our media team, video, lighting, sound, all of them have been amazing. Our worship team has been worshiping us through this whole process and 
leading us into the presence of God in our homes, and I'm grateful for them. Our, our, our crew leaders who have been helping us gather together on Zoom calls and in other ways throughout this time, thank you guys so, so much. Can we put our hands together and thank God for our crew leaders? And um, Maybe during this time you realized how much you need a crew or how important a crew is, which basically is what we call our small groups around here. And so when you can't gather in this space like this, it's important that you have a community of people that you're doing life with. And so we encourage you to go on our website and look for a crew that you can be a part of. And if you see that there isn't a crew that you feel like you can jump in and be a part of, that might mean that God is challenging you to start one. And uh, so we need people to lead crews and take on them that responsibility of leading people in community and fellowship. And that would be incredible. So check that out on our website. And so I want to say thank you to our, uh, our oversight, not only our pastors and elders in this church who are incredible and have been a great strength to Monica and I, especially during this time, but our oversight of the outside leadership of this church from Bishop Courtney McBath to Bishop Brian Green to Dr. Uh, Schiltz and Dr. Pruitt. These are the four men that oversee our church and our lives. And they're the people that if I get out of hand, they'll come in and they'll fix me <laughs> in a heartbeat. They have the authority to do that. And uh, so I'm so thankful for them. And I've been talking to them and so encouraged by them. And even during this process with uh, Bishop Courtney McBath and Bishop Green, who lead uh, predominantly African-American churches, uh, being able to talk with them and communicate with them during all that's happening in our nation has been really eye-opening for me and encouraging for me and so helpful. Uh, their leadership and guidance has been for me. I actually have, uh, in the past, when we've gone through situations like this before, this is uh, nothing new. Uh, I think Will Smith said something very appropriate. He said, uh, uh, racism is nothing new. It's just now it's being filmed, you know, and uh, we're seeing things that we never uh, were really privy to before. We heard stories and because it didn't hit our street or our corner or our address, uh, we felt disconnected from it. And uh, because we're seeing it so clearly, um, it's, it's really having a unique impact on our lives. And this is nothing new to our country, what's happening it's been happening. How many times has it happened and nobody caught it on film? How many times has someone been mistreated and uh, uh, beaten or abused or mishandled and nobody was looking and nobody was watching? And so just their, their input and their oversight and their leadership in my life. And I've actually called Bishop McBath before, like I said, and I asked him, I said, listen, if you were, if you were in, in my church on Sunday and your pastor was white, what would you want to hear from me? And I love Bishop McBath's response. He said, all I want to know is that you hear me. I don't expect you to fix every problem that the country faces. All I want to know is that you hear me and you see me. And um, so I've been praying that our eyes would be open uh, to the issues that face us, that we would become more aware of things that maybe don't so directly impact uh, Johnson City. For instance, uh, I went last night to a protest and to a prayer service uh, last night. No police cars were being vandalized. No uh, department stores were being looted and set on fire. We are in a community that sometimes can be disconnected from what's happening in the rest of the world um, because because of different factors, because of the amount of African Americans in this city and in this region, uh, the type of policing that's done in our region. I want to thank God uh, for the leadership of the Johnson City Police Department who last night stood up and condemned the actions of that officer in, in Minneapolis. And uh, so I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for our community and we're blessed. But but can I tell you, don't look away because you're intimidated or you're scared at what's happening. Um, don't, don't try to bury your head in the sand and um, try to dismiss what's happening in our world. What we're dealing with is a history in America of the mistreatment, um, 
the mishandling, the misunderstanding of people who are black and brown in our society. And I, I, <laughs> I'm not educated enough. I'm not wise enough. I'm not, uh, I don't have enough experience to sit up here and act like I have all the solutions to all of the problems that plague our culture and our society. Um, but I want, to, I want to today make a few observations and then offer up a biblical solution if I can. Is that okay? Um, and because I don't want to, I don't want to try to simplify the problem by just saying Jesus is the answer, right? But I don't want to overcomplicate the problem by going into things that I'm unqualified to talk about and to deal with in this type of setting. So I just want to make a few observations, and I think all of us can, even if you don't agree with these observations, you can see maybe where I'm coming from and what I'm, what I'm trying to say. So this is, this is just some observations from someone who's, who's lived for 41 years, who has very limited uh, life experience, uh, very limited uh, um, degrees. I have one degree. It's in the book. It's in the Bible. <laughs> Uh, so I, I, I don't know it all, but these are just some observations from a human being named Robbie that happens to be a pastor and is white. Is, is that okay? So, okay. I, I believe that we are in a difficult and divisive time that right now is obviously intensified by months of isolation and a lack of real focus because of job loss, because of schools being closed. I believe even sports being shut down has had an effect on our psyches. Just yesterday, I heard that my, one of my nephews had a baseball game and I got so excited just to think of like, oh my gosh, they're playing baseball again. Little kids are playing baseball again. Some of us need that outlet of just going to a ball field and yelling at a referee instead of our televisions and (laughs) just need that, you know, and uh, we've been cooped up and that has done something to us, whether we whether we know it or not or recognize it or not, there is, there is some sort of trauma associated with what we've all gone through collectively but in different, different ways also. And then you add to that the divisive fear-based tactics of the media that drive us to be at the least suspicious of one another and at our worst hate one another public trust from the White House to our own neighborhoods is crumbling. Minority communities are crying out for help, especially the black community. And I'm not just talking about in a figurative sense, I'm talking literally, I can hear in my head, swirling in my head, the cries of George Floyd as he laid on the ground And he pleaded for his life. And he called out for his mom. I can can hear it in the same way that I can hear the cries as a pastor who believes in love and in life in Jesus. The same way I can hear the cries of 13,000 babies that are aborted every single day in this country. Injustice is a part of our society. When you look at the crimes that have been perpetrated against the black community, including abortion, because let me tell you something, the abortionists, they target minority communities. Their goal from the beginning The creator and the founder of Planned Parenthood said herself that birth control is the process of weeding out the unfit and preventing the birth of defectives. In New York City alone, there were thousands in 2018, there were thousands more babies, black babies that were killed by abortion than babies born. Think about that. In a community that is already devastated because they are the minority, 
the abortionists are targeting them in an attempt to annihilate their race from the earth. And the church wants to sit and pretend as if racism isn't an issue. Why would we argue over whether or not racism exists when we know without a shadow of a doubt that sin is real? I am not shocked when I see racism. I am not shocked when I see greed. I am not shocked when I see pride. I'm not shocked when I see those things. I'm actually shocked when I don't. I'm actually floored when I see people treating other people with respect. I'm actually blown away when I see people peaceably moving forward in a society together. I'm not shocked at the looting and the rioting. I'm not shocked at the reaction of people who feel like they haven't been heard for centuries. What I'm shocked by is when normal, peaceable things happen. Why? Because normal and peaceable and and unity only happens when Jesus and his Holy Spirit are present in the atmosphere. You can't have true peace without Jesus. And every attempt that we make to bring unity or to bring peace or to bring reconciliation will fail without the power of God on our side. Psalm 127 and 1 says that those that labor, they labor in vain. If you build something, you build it in vain unless the Lord is the one who builds it. The Bible teaches us that the watchmen, they watch the city and they look over the city in vain unless the Lord is the one who watches over the city. Yes, we need new laws. Yes, we need good police officers and we have really good police officers, but we've got some really bad ones. But I'm telling you what isn't going to solve the problems of America is a legislated morality. What will solve the issues of America is a regenerated heart committed to Jesus Christ, committed to his kingdom, committed to the values that the Bible puts on every single person that God has ever created. What else do we expect in a world that rebels against his word and says that his word is optional and says that God is optional? God is not optional and the church is not optional. God is essential and his church is essential. If we are going to see the change that we want to see in the country that we live in, we don't need God to fix America. We need the kingdom of God to come. Jesus said, this is how you pray. He didn't pray, God, fix our government. He said, pray, God, your your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because every man-made thing we've ever built, every structure and every system that man has ever built has been corrupt. So I'm not shocked when I see systematic racism. I'm not shocked when I see systematic abuse. Why? Because those structures were built by men who are sinful in their nature. It's amazing, isn't it, that the church looks at the world and goes, why are they acting like that? Why are people so upset? Why would they? They're lost. Jesus said they're like sheep without a shepherd. Aren't you thankful that God didn't look at the condition of the world and just say, it's too violent for me. It's too gone for me. It's too broken for me. But he said, it's it's ripe for a move from heaven. And the Bible says that at the appointed time, Jesus was released into the earth. Hope came into the earth. And today, we're celebrating Pentecost Sunday. Today, we're celebrating the birth of the church. Do you realize that that Pentecost was actually a celebration of the law being given? And on Pentecost Sunday in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says that believers were gathered 
from all over the world, the known world at that time. They were there to celebrate Passover. Passover was the recognition. It was a feast surrounding the law being given in the Old Testament. But man, when the law was given in the Old Testament, 3,000 people were killed that day. But when the Spirit came in Acts chapter 2 on Pentecost Sunday, the Bible says 3,000 people were added to the church that day and 3,000 people who were dead in their sins came alive unto God through Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches us that the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. What we need in America is a move, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God. Come on, somebody. Like more than anything. Yes, we protest. Yes, we stand up when we see injustice and we shout about it and we, we refuse to be quiet about it. But we cannot neglect the, the power behind all of our efforts. We cannot neglect the only one who can really put any, any real oomph behind what we do. The Bible says that the Holy Ghost is like a wind that blows wherever it wants to blow. There's no system. There's no structure. There's no demonic force. There's no oppression. There's nothing the world can do to withstand the Holy Spirit and the church that he's empowering. Come on, if there's anybody in the room today who would say, Holy Spirit, once again, we want you to have your way I want you to have your way. I want you to do what only you can do. Our voices aren't loud enough. They never have been. We've had some of the greatest orators and communicators in the history of the world talk about these issues. Has progress been made? Absolutely. Are we where we need to be? No, we are not even close. You can have a man as gifted and as eloquent as Martin Luther King Jr. But his words fall short if there's no Holy Ghost power behind them. You can have people stand in the streets with megaphones and scream until their faces turn blue. But nothing changes unless the Holy Ghost gets involved. You can have a church, have prayer vigils and meet and have all night prayer meetings, but unless the Holy, shows, Holy Ghost shows up in that prayer meeting, nothing is going to change. What we need is less talk and more power. Less talk and more demonstration. Paul said this, he said, I don't come to you with eloquence of words. I didn't, I didn't invite you back to church today so that I can press you with my sermon. I invited you back to church today so that you could feel the power of God in this room. So that when you leave this place, your life will be impacted not by my words, but by his spirit. If the only thing that happens when we get together is we hear some good songs and I say some good things, then nothing really happened. But if the Holy Spirit gets involved, anything is possible. Anything is possible. So what do we recognize? Racism is real and it's the result of sin. So if you, if you understand sin, you're not here to argue over whether or not racism exists. You're surprised when it isn't. You're surprised when it isn't a part of the equation. You're surprised when it isn't a part of people's experience in the world. I got a call this week and one of my, one of my friends that I love very much, we were talking about this issue. Last night, I was texting back and forth with a pastor. His name's Darius Daniels and we met just a few years ago at a conference we were both preaching at. And I was the only white speaker at this conference. And we, we, we connected, and, and I love him very much. And he was telling me last night, he was telling me about when black people, he said, Robbie, when black people see a video like, like the one they saw with that officer's knee on George Floyd's neck, or they see a video like the one with Ahmaud Aubrey and he's being chased in the streets by, by men in a truck and weapons. He said, what that does to the black community is it, it traumatizes us. 
Maybe it didn't happen to me personally, but it feels like me, he said. He said, for instance, I've got a friend in in our church and we've been talking back and forth and he said, this man has two doctorate degrees. He's been to the greatest universities and been educated in the greatest universities in this country. He's learned his entire life how to, how to navigate his life through a system dominated by white people. He, he's learned how to interact. He's learned how to, to exist. He's learned how to work together and to function together. He said, but he has been crying and weeping for three straight days because his son, his 12-year-old son, came and asked him, Dad, are they going to kill me? Trauma. Didn't happen to him, but it feels like it did. And until we can get down in the middle of that emotion and feel that with black and brown people, then we will never be able to move forward because here's the thing about Jesus. Jesus teaches us that to advance the gospel, you must continue to put yourself in another man's world. To really follow Jesus is to constantly journey into places and spaces that you are uncomfortable in. Don't tell me that the Son of God felt comfortable in human flesh. That the Holy One felt comfortable. No, but He left His comfort and He got down in the middle of our mess and he said, let me help. He said, let me, let me see. Tell me. And he listened to people's stories. And he wept over their cities. And he cried over their babies when they died. And he visited funerals. He had friends get murdered. We don't have a high priest who doesn't understand our problems and our issues. That's why he is a God for all people and with all people. And as Christians, we have to understand that and we have to recognize that. And if we refuse to look at it, then we're going to leave this to our kids and our grandkids. I just refuse to do that. I'm sorry. And can I do this? I, I, I'm only doing this in third service because I have just a little bit more time and your kids are being real quiet right now. <laughs> but can I, can I say, I'm not even going to ask. I'm going to say this. Um, can I talk to you for a second about the misunderstanding of white privilege? Can, can, I, can we do that for a second? Because I think sometimes when white people hear white privilege, we, we automatically, the, 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 the hands go up and it's like, I'm not a racist. I'm not a racist. And nobody is saying that because you have white privilege that you are a racist. First of all, get educated on what these terms actually mean and what they're saying so that you can properly communicate with people who are trying to have real conversations. What somebody is saying when they say that you have white privilege, all they're saying is that maybe you and I have both had a tough life but your skin color was never a part of your struggle. That's all they're saying. And for us to be so arrogant that we can't hear that puts us in a position where we cannot help if we cannot hear that. We've got to be able to hear that so that we can say, yeah, I understand that. See, white people and black people both have difficult lives. But the thing white people in this country have never had to experience is injustice because of the color of their skin. That's all white privilege is. Nobody's saying you're a racist. Well, some, some people might be. But that's not what anybody is saying. Racism is when you devalue another person because of the color of their skin. And you think that you are superior to them because of the color of their skin. So when someone says white privilege, what they're not saying is white nationalism. What they're not saying is white supremacy. What they're not saying is racism. 
They're saying that because you were born white, you were born with the advantage when it comes to the color of your skin. That's it. Can we hear that? Can we stop trying to kill each other on Facebook over that? Is that okay? Now watch. Watch this. This is powerful because in Acts chapter 4, and this is where I'm going to finish. In Acts chapter 4, we see the church has already been born. They've already been filled with the Holy Spirit. And here in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John have been arrested. They've gone before these, these priests of the Jewish people. And these priests are angry because they're running around talking about Jesus. And they're threatening them and saying, if you keep preaching in the name of Jesus, we're going to take your life. And they said, well, we're sorry, but uh, you can threaten us all you want, but we got the power of God on our side because the Bible says Peter, full of the Holy Ghost, stood up and said, (laughs) man, we need some people full of the Holy Ghost to just stand up and The Bible says, so, so somehow they found favor and they get released and they go back to their, their friends and companions. And the Bible says they go into the room where they are and they get together <laughs> and they start, to, they, start to, they start to pray. When they were faced with difficulty, when they looked around them and the world was in chaos and their world was being threatened, what did they do? What did the early church do? Did they go run and hide And binge Netflix just to bury their head head in the sand? No, the Bible says they got together and they prayed and they said, God, give us boldness like we've never known before. And the Bible says when they prayed that prayer that the Spirit of God hit the house where they were in. And the walls of that house began to shake. There was a shaking. I'm going to tell you something you have to understand about revival. Before you will experience an awakening, there will always be a shaking. And when a shaking comes, some things will make it through, but some things will fall and crumble to the ground. And in this shaking, all of a sudden, there's an overwhelming experience that happens in their life. And the Bible says, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they began to preach the word of the Lord with boldness. Man, today we need some just good old fashioned boldness. Listen, listen, not about my political affiliation because some of y'all are really bold about that. But you won't say nothing about Jesus. You, you, you lay on the altar and die for your party, but you wouldn't die for the Lamb of God. You'd die for a donkey or an elephant, but you wouldn't say one word about the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. And they were emboldened not to declare their political affiliation, but to declare the God they served. Because the only hope, the only remedy, the only solution truly is, and I know, again, it sounds simplistic and it sounds just like this little, little, you know, cliche statement, but Jesus is truly the answer for all of the issues that plague the world today. And a Holy Ghost filled church full of boldness that will stand up and declare that Jesus Christ is the Lord. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. There is no one like Him. There is no one besides Him. There is no one who has ever come close to Him. That Jesus reigns. I'm telling you, we'll see awakening. If you would go ahead and stand on your feet. The Bible says they cried out for boldness, for courage, for empowerment. When we refuse to cower in fear, but instead courageously carry the gospel to our culture, we will be filled again with the Holy Ghost. And I say again on purpose. Listen, in Acts chapter two, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter two, most of the same people were together that day. And the Bible says, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. What the book of Acts teaches us is that the Holy Spirit is, and his filling is not just a one-time encounter that we have so we can get this little gift and we can walk around and say, look at mine, what'd you get? <laughs> well, I got prophecy. Oh, I got tongues. Oh, I got, no, like, like that's, not, that's not the point. The Holy Spirit is 
is there to empower us over and over and over and over again for the task at hand, for what's in front of us. And sometimes I need a gift, I need a different gift today than I had yesterday. And so I need, so here he is filling them again. And he fills them with boldness. Now what happens when he fills them? This is what the Bible says. Acts 4 and verse 31. It tells us that when, when they prayed for that boldness, the Holy Ghost filled the room and he filled the people. Second thing that happened was the word of God is gonna be preached and gets preached with boldness. Third thing that happens in verse 32, we see that the church gets on mission and they stay unified in their mission. Fourth thing we see is that the world starts to hear about the hope of the resurrection. Can I tell you something? No matter what we do in this day and in this hour, and we should do whatever we can do, but whatever we do is never going to make this world perfect. Because as long as sin is with us, these issues that we see will always be with us. What do we do? We point people to the hope. When your hope is in the resurrection, you don't feel so hopeless in your life that, that your only outflow and your only response is rage and anger. But when your hope is in heaven, you recognize that this, this life is not what I was supposed to put my hope in anyway. I expected people to disappoint me. I expected people to mistreat me. I expected people to look at me sideways why because there's sin in the earth but when I get to heaven Jesus is going to love me perfectly there will be no more tears no more crying no more sadness no more no more injustice the hope that we have is not in a perfect America the hope that we have is in a resurrected savior that he who resurrected and defeated death has also defeated death for you and I and we will be resurrected with him we see in verse 33, we see God blessing his people and his favor being on his people. And then this is what we see in verse 34. This is, this is really the common thread throughout the whole New Testament experience. The Bible says that they were so radically taken over by the Holy Spirit that they operated in generosity that was over the top. I'm talking like people who were wealthy were saying, what's the point in all my wealth when my friend can't eat? So they sold their stuff so their friends could eat. What's the point in me having three cars when my friend can't even get one that runs correctly? This is when you know you're really following Jesus. The Holy Spirit is an agent of justice. <laughs> He says, if you see injustice around you, you do something about it. If you have to sell your stuff, if you have to raise your voice, if you have to stand hand in hand with somebody, if you have to put your issue down to take up their issue, you do whatever you have to do so that you bring justice in the earth. The Bible teaches us, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Revival isn't easy. Awakening, awakening isn't nice and neat. It's disruptive, it's expensive. But no matter what gets shaken, God will not be shaken off of his throne. You can't shake God from his throne. You can't push God off of his throne. He's there forever. And just like his word, it will last forever. Every, every person that's ever had an opinion died but God's word remains. People said God didn't exist. God doesn't exist. Well, he keeps on getting preached and you're in the grave somewhere. So, so much for, so much for your opinion. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, he does not need to be tamed. I think one of the reasons in America that we lack the power of the spirit is that we've been trying to tame the spirit. We've been, we've been trying to make him acceptable to the world. Like, like, yeah, you know, like, hey man, do you, do you believe in the Holy Ghost? Well, 
Yeah, but like, I mean, decently and in order. <laughs> I don't, you know. Um, well, what about that prophecy thing? Well, I mean, I, I guess, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't know. That's, I, what about tongues? I mean, probably not, you know, you know, there's not a lot of people who do that anymore. It's just, you know, and if you come to our church, you're probably not going to hear it, you know, or, you know, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be, re- he's, he, he's going to be really tame. Like we're going to put him in a box and just kind of lock him up. And then when we need a goose bump, we'll get, we're going we're gonna to shout really loud and he'll just jump out and be like, boo. And then he'll run back to his box and be like, thanks for letting me show up, guys. Like we've tamed him. But we, we have to stop trying to tame the Holy Spirit. The reason they had to explain him is because he was out of control. To be honest, the Bible says he's like the wind. He goes wherever he wants to go. He blows over whatever he wants to blow over. He runs into temples and he up, he throws the tables around and he, and he, and he, I'm just telling you, you cannot tame the Holy Ghost and really experience the Holy Ghost. See, we have benefit of hindsight and we do things in reverse order. We try to explain him before we release him because we've got Paul's explanation of the Holy Ghost. Paul had to come in and he had to say, well, I mean, this is out of order, guys. You need to just just chill out with that. You're acting crazy. But that was after he had already been released. The problem is we're trying to tame something that we've not even allowed to be released. He doesn't need to be tamed. He needs to be released. Listen, the Holy Spirit, when they got filled with boldness, the, the Bible teaches us that he, he, took, he turned cowards, people that were hiding in their homes because they were afraid of the Roman government and their own Jewish people. Made, he took cowards and turned them into lions. And they were out there dying in the streets for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Bible said Stephen stood there as they stoned him. And he looked up to heaven and he was still preaching the gospel as he was falling down on his back. And the Lord was standing in heaven saying. Turn liars into preachers. Turn murderers into martyrs. He opened up prison doors, set captives free. See, see, when I, when I see the chaos that's in our world, I I hear a cry. I hear a sound. I hear, I hear people crying out for more. They run into a store looking for more, but that's not what they need. That's not what they're really crying out for. When you feel that longing in your soul, my dad and I were talking about this the other day. He said, Robbie, how, how is it that we can have so much and be so blessed but feel so empty sometimes? I said, Dad, it's because this world was never meant to satisfy us. He said, that's it, Rob. He said, that's, that, that's it because we have put so much confidence in stuff that cannot satisfy the longing of our heart. You know what you're longing for? You're longing for blind eyes to be open. That's that, that's that discomfort that you feel on the inside. That's why you sit with all your money in your big old house and you still feel empty. It's because what you long for is the miracle working power of God to be active in the earth again. You long for prison doors to be open, blind eyes to be open. You long to see dead people raised to life. I'm telling you, we need to cry out for boldness. Is there anybody in the room this morning who wants to throw your hands up in the air and say, God, baptize us in the Holy Spirit once again shake these walls once again in the name of Jesus hallelujah 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 see the goal is not that we would say man we had church today the goal is that when we leave this place what happens in Vegas doesn't stay in Vegas The goal is that what happened in this room this morning actually begins to take effect when you go to eat today or you sit down with your family today or you call somebody on the phone today. Whatever you do, the Holy Spirit says, if you'll if you'll unleash me, I've got I've got. He says, where are you going to eat today? Uh, I'm going to go. I'm going to I don't know. I'm going to I'm going to go to uh, where's where's somebody going to go today? Anybody got plans after the service? You're gonna to go to Carabas. I just love Carabas. Y'all know my affinity for Carabas. Like it's the bread, it's the oil, 
It's the balsamic vinegar. <laughs> it's just, ah, I love it. So maybe, but do you, can I tell you something? God has a word for somebody who didn't get to come to church today because they're working at Carabas, and he's got that word in your mouth if you'll open up and let the Holy Ghost use you. There's a waitress you're going to encounter today who's going through something. She's a single mom and she needs God to do something in her life. And God sent you there not to just eat that meal, but for you to leave a tip so she can pay her light bill this month. That's, I, I just want you to know that what happens in here has to leave here or all this is for nothing. It's for nothing. I love y'all. We, we're not going to just be a normal church like can I tell you something like when history remembers 1985 to 2025 we're going to be talked about we're going to leave our mark and this city is going to thank God that we're here this city is going to bless God that we are here they already have in some ways but we're just getting started the best is yet to come and the biggest difference we've ever made we're going to make over the next five years i believe it with all of my heart come on somebody god has been preparing us for 35 years for these next five years of impact i believe it in jesus name so father we thank you for your word today we thank you for this opportunity to gather together Thank you for this wild and crazy third service that let me preach for 30, not no 40 minutes now with their kids in the audience who have been little angels. Maybe that's just because I'm not sitting beside of them, but thank you for it, God. And we pray that what happens in here refuses to stay in here. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody shouted amen. 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 I love you. God bless you. <laughs> There's offering buckets up here if you want to give. And uh, if, you, if you give online, it's all good. We love you. Third service, you can, you can exit out of any, any of the doors you want to. Look at you. You get all the exits. Exits. <laughs>